In the pantheon of sports entertainment, the 1990s stand tall as a golden era of professional wrestling, a decade marked by unprecedented growth, fierce competition, and the birth of iconic legends. As we journey back through the 1990s, we find a wrestling landscape that was reshaped, not just through physical battles inside of the ring, but through the behind-the-scenes corporate duels that defined a generation. In this video, we revisit this formidable era, beginning with the promotions that served as the battleground for these epic showdowns. In the early 90s, the WWF bid farewell to the golden era icons like Hulk Hogan and embraced a new generation of superstars such as Bret the Hitman Hart and Shawn Michaels. Their storytelling evolved, shifting towards more mature and edgier narratives. The onset of the Attitude Era in the latter half of the decade introduced us to legends like Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock, who would define wrestling for years to come. Simultaneously, WCW was rising to power, igniting the Monday Night Wars, a rating battle that saw WCW even overtaking their long-term rivals in WWF for an extended period of time. WCW ushered in the New World Order, an innovation that blurred the lines between storyline and reality, forever changing the way that wrestling narratives were crafted. While the 90s showcased wrestling's male superstars, it was also a pivotal period for women in the industry. Names like Alundra Blaze and later Sable and China stepped into the limelight, breaking barriers and laying a foundation for future generations of female athletes. The 90s were characterised by deep, intricate storylines and unforgettable rivalries. The Undertaker's mystique grew with the introduction of elements like the Hell in the Cell and his iconic WrestleMania streak. Rivalries like Bret Hart vs Shawn Michaels narrated stories of passion, betrayal and honour, crafting wrestling lore that is revered to this very day. The decade also saw the heartbreaking real-life tragedy of Owen Hart, a sobering moment that reminded fans and performers alike of the real dangers of the squared circle. The 90s brought wrestling into a global stage, utilising satellite technology and the burgeoning internet to reach fans worldwide. Pay-per-view events became grander and productions more cinematic, painting wrestling as a form of live theatre with a splash of Hollywood glamour. Pro wrestling in the 90s was not just a sports phenomenon, it became a critical part of pop culture. The wrestlers themselves became household names, transcending the ring to dominate screens both big and small, while catchphrases from this era became part of the everyday vernacular. As we close the book on the 1990s, we find an industry transformed, elevated to heights unimaginable at the decade's start. It was an era of legends, of warriors battling not just for titles, but for the very soul of the industry. The 90s bestowed upon us a rich tapestry of narratives, a gallery of iconic heroes and villains, and moments etched into the annals of time, not as mere wrestling stories, but as part of a global folklore. It was a time of growth, innovation, and perhaps most importantly, a time when wrestling captured the imagination and hearts of people all around the world, leaving a legacy that reverberates in the wrestling business to this day. As we revisit this golden era of wrestling, we do so with reverence, honouring the performers, the writers, and the fans who made the 90s a period of pro wrestling history that remains unmatched, a true golden era of professional wrestling. The year kicked off with an exciting collaboration between New Japan Pro Wrestling and the WCW for the Fantastic Story pay-per-view event on January the 4th at the Tokyo Dome. This spectacular event attracted 63,500 fans and generated over $3 million in ticket revenue alone, marking the second year of collaboration with the American WCW. The event featured a total of 10 bouts. Highlights included Sting's victory over Hiroshi Hase. A notable highlight was the title match, where Jushin Thunder Liger claimed the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship from Ultimo Dragon. Additionally, the Great Muta, holding the IWGP Heavyweight Championship, secured the NWA World Heavyweight Championship in a dual title match against Masahiro Chono. The, the following event was later broadcast as WCW New Japan Super Show 3 in North America. On January the 11th, WWF's Monday Night Raw made its debut, with the inaugural episode being filmed at the Manhattan Center in New York City. 
This new program was broadcast on the USA Network, taking over the slot previously occupied by Primetime Wrestling, which had a successful eight-year run. Vince McMahon, Randy Savage and Rob Bartlett were the original hosts of the show, as well as serving as traditional commentators. Raw, with a runtime of around 60 minutes, introduced a novel approach to broadcasting professional wrestling. Unlike traditional programming shows that were typically pre-recorded in studios with limited audiences or in large arenas, Raw presented a fresh format. It diverged from the pre-recorded weekend shows like Superstars and Wrestling Challenge, which were known for their advanced taped matches with studio voiceovers and pre-recorded discussions. Instead, Raw offered a dynamic experience being shot and broadcast live. This allowed for real-time audience interaction and the unfolding of storylines and matches as they happened, bringing a new level of excitement to televised wrestling. In the very first Monday Night Raw main event, The Undertaker, accompanied by Paul Bearer, faced off against Damian Demento. Despite Demento's effort to gain the upper hand with a punch, The Undertaker remained unaffected by the attack. The match concluded with The Undertaker executing his iconic Tombstone pile driver, decisively sealing Demento's fate. Luis Hernandez and The Ultimate Warrior have both stated since how, when the rules became more strict and the laws change, they had a tough time transitioning away from certain chemicals and found it easier to move away from the WWF. By 1993, WWF had moved its Titan HQ to Connecticut and absorbed all other branches of its business, consolidating all of its operations and focusing on a build towards the new generation. After a sexual harassment lawsuit and a huge steroid scandal, losing more than $5 million for WWF at a time where fan interest was dwindling. McMahon had no choice but to implement a drug testing policy across his bodybuilding organisation and immediately the House of Cards collapsed. Half of the roster refused to be tested and cancelled their contracts and decimated plans for their upcoming show. Those who were left were the smaller and less visually impressive performers who had never taken steroids, and a few who had previously taken performance enhancers but had stopped when the testing policy was introduced, leading to a smaller and ever-deflating roster. The final nail in the coffin was the big main event. Lex Luger was injured in the lead-up and could not appear. His opponent, Lou Ferrigno, also refused to be tested and left the company shortly after. The show proved to be even less successful than the first, with reports explaining that only 3,000 homes bought the pay-per-view and had left McMahon's idea dead in the water. The company was dissolved a month later when Vince called the owners of rival IFBB and conceded to them his defeat. A financial critical and commercial failure on every front, Vincent McMahon learnt on this day, for the first time, that not everything he touches turns to gold. The Texas Death I Quit match between Terry Funk and Eddie Gilbert at ECW's Battle of the Belts on January the 23rd was a notably intense encounter. The match began with a heated stare down, escalating to physical confrontations both inside and outside of the ring. Funk dominated portions of the match, using a variety of brutal tactics. Gilbert fought back fiercely, even resorting to throwing a fireball into Funk's face. The match's climax saw Gilbert trapped and in pain, leading him to surrender, declaring, You're breaking my leg, into the microphone. This grueling match lasted over 23 minutes, ending with Funk's victory, but leaving both wrestlers visibly exhausted and battered. On January the 24th in Sacramento, California, the WWF Royal Rumble event unfolded with a thrilling showcase of wrestling talent. The climax was the 30-man Royal Rumble match, where Yokozuna emerged victorious, earning a coveted WWF World Heavyweight Championship match at WrestleMania 9. The victory marked a significant milestone in Royal Rumble history, as Yokozuna became the first wrestler to win a guaranteed World Championship match at the following WrestleMania setting a new standard for future rumbles. The event also featured other high-stakes matches, including Bret Hart successfully defending the WWF World Heavyweight Championship against Razor Ramon, and Shawn Michaels retaining the WWF Intercontinental Belt in a dynamic bout against Marty Jannetty, one that would go on to be voted Match of the Year. On the 10th of February, Bill Watts resigned as Executive Vice President of Wrestling Operations for WCW. 
Two days later, Eric Bischoff became executive producer of all of World Championship Wrestling's television and Ole Anderson was announced as the new vice president of wrestling operations, marking a huge turning point for the company, the ripple effect of which would change the course of the next decade in the pro wrestling world. Kerry Von Erich was born Kerry Jean Ackerson on February the 3rd, 1960 in Niagara Falls, New York and was the fourth son of Fritz Von Erich. He was a professional wrestler and was popularly known as the modern day warrior and the Texas Tornado. Kerry spent the majority of his wrestling career in world class and he was the most successful of the Von Erich family by far. Even with all this success however, Kerry felt the pressure of the Von Erich name. When I started setting the discus record, I wanted to be known as Kerry Atkinson, not just Fritz Von Erich's son, but then I felt sort of bad about that, so I let people call me Kerry Von Erich. Kerry had many notable feuds during his career, including those against Gino Hernandez, Iceman Parsons, Chris Adams and the fabulous Freebirds. He also joined the World Wrestling Federation and wrestled under the name of the Texas Tornado. During his time in the WWF, he won the WWF Intercontinental Championship at SummerSlam on August the 29th in 1990. Kerry got married to Catherine Murray on June the 18th, 1983. Together they had two daughters. However, the couple later separated and divorced on April the 22nd, 1992. Kerry was involved in a serious motorcycle accident in June of 1986 while riding near his home in Texas. The accident occurred when he collided with a car that turned in front of him, resulting in a dislocated hip, broken ankle and shattered foot. Von Erich underwent multiple surgeries, including a hip replacement, but contracted acute hepatitis from a blood transfusion during one of the surgeries. He was a loving father, he was a loving person. I know that after his motorcycle accident, there was a lot of inner turmoil, just kind of feeling like a fraud. So you can only imagine what that might do to someone because you're hiding something and you can't be your true self and that was the big deal. Despite his injuries and health issues, Von Erich returned to wrestling later that year and continued to compete for several more years following. However, the accident took a toll on his body and eventually led to his retirement from wrestling. After the amputation, Kerry tried to hide the injury from the public and expected his family to do the same. However, this not only limited his in-ring ability, but also led to an addiction to painkillers and subsequent arrests. In 1992, his marriage with his wife Kathy also ended. Daddy started thinking he had spiders in his arms. I don't know if I should get into all of that, but, you know, kind of hallucinating. He was digging into his arms, and he would be like, Baby, do you see that? Do you see it moving? That was like towards the end, when I was much older. So I saw things like that, but yeah, my mum always said, your dad's sick, and it was so hard for her to let us go with him when it was his time, but she knew that was important, but he was sick, that's what my mum always used to say. Kerry's addiction and legal problems continued to worsen, and he was indicted on a charge that would likely result in extensive jail time, violating his probation. Around this time, Kerry began seeking advice from fellow wrestler Bret Hart. The two shared stories about the love they held for their brothers. Bret had since explained that Kerry would regularly discuss the idea of suicide and his desire to join his older brothers in heaven. Shocking news for wrestling fans this morning. Pro wrestler Kerry Von Erich has apparently taken his own life. He was one of the members of the famous Von Erich wrestling family, Kerry was found yesterday by his father near a farmhouse on the family ranch near Dallas. Friends say Von Erich was suffering from a drug addiction and depressed over the deaths of his brothers. Kerry Von Erich was scheduled to wrestle tonight in Dallas against the Angel of Death. One day after the indictment, Kerry committed suicide on February the 18th, 1993, on his father's ranch in Denton County, Texas. Kerry shot himself with a 44 caliber bullet through his heart at the age of 33. The swift downfall he experienced in the preceding year is believed to have contributed to his decision to end his life. Kerry's heavy usage of narcotics and constant partying only served to exacerbate the terrible situation. After his untimely demise, his father Fritz placed a marker on the spot where Kerry had shot himself. The marker, in the form of an angel, serves as a sombre reminder of the tragedy that took place on the ranch. Kerry's death was a devastating loss for his family and friends, and his legacy as a talented performer continues to this day. 
Kerry and I talked on and on about our brothers and the good times that we'd both had as famous families in such a strange business. Kerry confined that he'd made up his mind to join his brothers in heaven. He was only waiting for God to tell him when. I said, Kerry, your children will always need you, even more than your brothers do. You have to think of your children. He allowed me to think I'd managed to change his mind, but I'd feared it was only lip service. On February the 18th, I heard that Kerry Von Erich had shot himself in the heart, left a note that said he was joining his brothers in heaven. Owen and I were deeply saddened, but who could be surprised? Few who have followed the Von Erich story should be shocked at last week's suicide by Kerry, the most famous photogenic Von Erich. The Von Erich history, indeed, the history of professional wrestling in Fort Worth, Dallas, has been so rife with tragedy that the question was never whether tragedy would occur again, but when. Kevin Von Erich described his brother's addiction in an interview with Texas Monthly, saying, Kerry wasn't addicted to any one drug. He liked drugs. It wasn't that he liked coke or ice or meth. He just liked that life of parties. Kerry figured that he didn't have anything to live for. He was rootless. He had no home. Seeing me with my family made his pain greater. It reminded him of what he was missing. It was such a sad, tragic thing. He had his two beautiful daughters and a wife he loved, but then he'd come home and all his stuff would be moved out. She'd move all of his stuff out. Kerry was no saint, but they both treated each other kind of rough. He had pretty much come to an understanding the day he killed himself. He just left having lunch with Kathy, his wife. Kerry was going to jail. He was afraid of never seeing his girls again. He said, Kevin, I'm about to kill myself. We had talked for about an hour. We told some good dirty jokes. We laughed and he told me, I'm going to kill myself. I thought I had talked him out of it. He said, I didn't want to be like Mike and not say goodbye. That's when I begged him. I said, don't do this. Don't leave me alone. You're my only brother. Don't leave me. I thought I had talked him out of it. 30 minutes later, they found his body. He must have gone right out and done it. On January the 13th, 1993, he was arrested again on cocaine possession charges. On February the 17th, the grand jury indictment came down. The following morning, a Thursday, Kerry tried calling his lawyer and friend, Charles Caperton, who was in court. He called Kevin 180 miles away in Jefferson and said he might kill himself Monday. He went for lunch with his ex-wife and for the umpteenth time told Kathy he'd kill himself if they couldn't get back together. In February of 1993, Ric Flair made a celebrated return to WCW, greeted warmly as a hero. Bound by a no-compete clause at the time, Flair couldn't immediately step back into the ring for a match. Instead, he took on a different role by hosting his own talk show in WCW, aptly named a Flair for the Gold. The show featured regular appearances by Arn Anderson, who was often seen at the bar on the set. Additionally, the show was spiced up by the presence of Flair's maid, Fifi, who was involved in various activities like cleaning and presenting gifts. This event also marked the first WCW appearance of Davy Boy Smith, known as the British Bulldog. The highlight of the evening was a unique White Castle of Fear strap match between Big Van Vader and Sting, where, notably, Vader's WCW World Heavyweight Championship was not at stake, as the match was not officially sanctioned by the company. Additionally, the event showcased a clash between the Great Muta and Barry Windham for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. This particular pay-per-view was the first under the executive production of Eric Bischoff, who also maintained his role as a television announcer. His new executive role was only acknowledged in the show's closing credits. Come gather round children, it's high time he learns About a hero named Homer and a devil named Burns Dr Hillbilly and the Iron Yuppie the next instance I'd like to examine comes from one of the most beloved and fondly remembered Simpsons episodes of all time. Entertainment Weekly in 2003 ranked it as their best episode of all time and noted, This episode is virtually flawless, the product of a series at the height of its creative powers when satire was still savage and relevant. Last Exit to Springfield, which originally aired way back in 1993, is perhaps not remembered for its pro wrestling. However, we do get a great insight into the view the general audience had of the violence in wrestling at the time. We see an announcer introduce Dr. Hillbilly and the Iron Yuppie ahead of their upcoming deathmatch. 
we are given a textbook example of fierce rivals facing off something that we see so often before a pro wrestling match. Two giant men ready to go to war with hate in their eyes and their masks on the line. The ECW Television Championship Tournament was an eight-man tournament for the vacated ECW belt on March the 12th, 1993. The former champion Glenn Osborne was stripped of the title, resulting in the belt being decided in that tournament. The matches aired on television between April the 6th and April the 20th episode of Eastern Championship Wrestling. In the final, Jimmy Snooker claimed the television title with a victory over Glenn Osborne. Ladies and gentlemen, before we continue with the matches, I'd like to announce the death of one of my favorite wrestlers and one of the most famous wrestlers of all time. I think probably there's three. Gorgeous George, Hulk Hogan, and Andre the Giant. He died this week in uh, Paris, France, after going home to his father's funeral. Uh, he was 46 years old and he had a disease all of his life that he was born with where he kept growing and growing and growing. And uh, as you know, he was seven foot four when he wrestled for us and weighed about 450 pounds and he uh, died over 500 pounds. So he was going to continue growing all of his life. Thank you. He was a giant among men and he was a giant of a friend. In 1993, the WWE Hall of Fame was established to honour and commemorate the achievements of exceptional professional wrestlers. Andre the Giant, a legendary figure in the world of wrestling, had the honour of being the inaugural inductee. His induction came shortly after his death on January the 27th, 1993. Although Andre's induction into the Hall of Fame was announced on the March 22nd, 1993 edition of Monday Night Raw, WWE did not conduct a formal Hall of Fame induction ceremony until the following year. This initiation set a precedent for recognising the contributions of wrestlers to the sport and entertainment industry as a whole. By 1993, The Undertaker was embroiled in a feud with manager Harvey Wimpleman. Each week, The Undertaker would become enraged at Wimpleman and attempt an attack only to be presented by one of Wimpleman's proxies. Each week, the Undertaker would destroy these wrestlers in an attempt to get his hands on his new nemesis. When the Royal Rumble came around, Harvey Wimpleman had one last trick up his sleeve. During the match, he introduced Giant Gonzalez, an enormous man who was presented as a literal animalistic giant, but who was in fact just a large person in a hairy, muscular onesie. Regardless, the size of the giant was clear for all to see, and his plan, instigated by Wimpleman, was devilish too. Giant Gonzalez eliminated The Undertaker during the Royal Rumble with the knowledge that he would certainly get a chance to face the dead man at the upcoming WrestleMania event. As these two man mountains came face to face in Las Vegas for WrestleMania 9, the match was over before it began. Giant Gonzalez decided not to use his strength and size to win the match, but for some unexplained reason brought a rag with chloroform soaked into it to the ring and attempted to suffocate The Undertaker. Gonzalez was immediately disqualified for his actions, and the match fizzled out, earning The Undertaker his third WrestleMania victory. Jim Ross's departure from WCW and subsequent move to the WWF in 1993 marked a significant shift in his career. In WCW, Ross had risen to the position of head of broadcasting, but faced issues with Eric Bischoff, who later became an executive producer for the company. This tension led to Ross being taken off air, which prompted him to demand and receive his release from WCW. Fearing he wouldn't find work elsewhere due to being taken off television for an extended period, Ross then joined the World Wrestling Federation, marking his on-screen debut at WrestleMania 9, held at a special outdoor venue at Caesars Palace on the Las Vegas Strip. Everything changed in a short amount of time and I, and I had a chance to take the high road to the low road. First of all, going into WrestleMania 9, the plan was for Yokozuna to be our champion for the immediate future. That changed the weekend of WrestleMania, said Bruce Pritchard. The reasoning was because of the international tour we had coming up. It was going to be Hulk's farewell tour in a lot of respects, and we felt it would be better to have Hulk as the champion. At WrestleMania 9, the main event was Bret Hart versus Yokozuna. 
The match was short and certainly nothing to write home about, but before it was even finished, Hulk made his way to the ring, demanded a match with Yokozuna and beat him in seconds, stealing the limelight at the end of another big show. He later lied on a handshake and screwed Brett with McMahon. Hulk promised to drop the belt to Hart and then said, He isn't in my league, he can't lace my boots up, behind Brett's back. Later, dropping the belt instead to Yokozuna at SummerSlam, Hart confronted the pair who told him that that's just what you thought you heard, when Hart reminded them of the deal they had previously both agreed to. It was my harebrained idea and it caused quite a controversy. It was one of those audible wild wild west type situations. Initially Jim Ross took over from Gorilla Monsoon on the WWE Wrestling Challenge program the following weekend of WrestleMania 9 and worked alongside Bobby Heenan. Ross was initially the main voice of WWE's pay-per-view events calling both WrestleMania 9 and King of the Ring with Heenan and Randy Savage in 1993. However, Vincent Mann soon took over his position at pay-per-views, starting with SummerSlam. The first Triple-A, Triple Mania event, known simply at the time as Triple Mania, in its inaugural year, was a landmark in professional wrestling history. Held on April the 30th at Mexico City's Plaza del Toro Bullfighting Arena, it marked the first major show for Triple-A after its formation. The main event was a high-stakes retirement match between Conan and Cien Carras, a rare stipulation in Lucha Libre at the time where the loser had to retire. Another highlight was the semi-main event, a bet match between Perro Aguayo and Mascaro Anno 2000, with Aguayo's hair and Mascaro's mask on the line. This event, occurring less than a year after Triple R's establishment by Antonio Peña and various other wrestlers who had left CMLL, set the stage for Triple Mania to become Triple R's most significant annual event. Don't tell anybody I did that. Wouldn't it be so funny if a masculine alpha male had to look after some children? That would be so funny. I think it's really funny when men have to take time out from going to the gym and going into a bar and having a fight in order to take care of children. It's just so funny. Don't you think it's funny? Oh, you don't? You don't? Oh, okay. Well, yeah, don't ever watch Mr. Nanny from 1993 then, because that is the only joke throughout the entire film, and it goes over and over and over. It sucks. If you want to see a film about mischievous children who play pranks on their babysitter in order to gain attention of their parents, in a film with high production values and a heartwarming narrative, watch Nanny McPhee. If you want to see children who are ignored by their parents and end up having to use crazy plans and inventive traps in order to protect their home from a bunch of slapstick villains, then watch Home Alone. If you want to see a man out of his depth and struggling to learn the subtle nuances of everyday childcare, watch Mr. Mum. Mr. Nanny is an hour and a half full of over-the-top comic book style action. Considering it's aimed solely at young children, the movie becomes a lot more chaotic and violent than I'd expected before watching. But even those moments of explosive mayhem didn't really entice me, and I think that most people would feel about the same. The story is interesting enough to grab your attention, but the bare skeletal bones of the basic plot isn't enough to ever consider recommending this movie. It's bad throughout and holds extraordinary little significance in the modern day too. On May the 3rd, 1993, the Fukuoka Dome in Japan hosted the first Wrestling Dontaku, an event by New Japan Pro Wrestling. This seminal event stood out for its international collaboration, featuring stars from both World Championship Wrestling and the World Wrestling Federation, like Sting, Hulk Hogan and Jimmy Hart, alongside wrestlers from the Japanese promotion Wrestle and Romance. The event was packed with 10 professional wrestling matches. Additionally, a dream match took place between Hulk Hogan, the WWF champion at the time, and the Great Muta, the reigning IWGP heavyweight champion. The FMW 4th anniversary show, held on May the 5th, 93, at the Kawasaki Stadium in Kawasaki, Japan, was a pivotal event in the history of frontier martial arts wrestling. This show, marking the 4th anniversary of FMW, featured an iconic main event a no-rope, exploding, barbed-wire, time-bomb deathmatch between Atsushi Onita and Terry Funk. This match was a spectacle, with the ring set to explode every 15 minutes. Onita won with a flowing snap DDT, nearly four minutes before the entire ring was scheduled to explode. 
In a dramatic moment, Anita, after leaving the ring, returned to cover Funk, taking the blast himself, and the two wrestlers embraced after the match. The event was a major success for FMW, drawing a crowd of 41,000, the largest for the company at that time, and generating almost $2 million in revenue. The decision to host the fourth anniversary show at the Kawasaki Stadium followed the success of the second show in 1991, which drew 33,000 spectators. This venue choice highlighted the dream match between Onita, the promoter and main star of FMW at the time, and Terry Funk, a hardcore wrestling idol. In May, Razor was scheduled to face off against an up-and-comer by the name of 123 Kid, a trainee who nobody, fan nor wrestler would take seriously. He was small, fresh-faced and inexperienced. What hopes did he have of taking on the likes of Ramon, who towered over his daunted-looking foe? However, this was a new era of WWF. This match was going to be aired live on Monday Night Raw, a new concept for pro wrestling with a more unscripted and anything could happen atmosphere. So when the time came, Razor Ramon tried his best and chased the young upstart around the ring, flailing as his quicker adversary evaded his grasp. Now, the man behind the character, Scott Hall, was a shrewd wrestling mind. He understood what the fans want, and he understood how to deliver. So, during the match, through a once-in-a-lifetime miracle, the 1-2-3 kid was victorious and got the pin over Razor, creating not only a lasting and iconic image of an underdog's triumph, but also a platform for Sean Wartman, the man who played the 1-2-3 kid, to leapfrog his career from. It made for a gripping piece of unpredictable television. Ramon carried the loss with him to King of the Ring. By this time, Ted DiBiase had worn down Razor with his constant reminder of his loss to a man half his size. This led to the unexpected once again. The fans begun to show sympathy for Razor. They begun to boo slightly less when he appeared in the ring. So by the time Ramon and DiBiase faced off at SummerSlam, a complete change of character had happened. Razor Ramon had been humbled in defeat and shown signs of vulnerability which crowds had warmed to. When Ramon pinned DiBiase in the Million Dollar Man's last WWF match, the fans were firmly on the bad guy's side. Hey, yo. On May the 23rd, WCW hosted its first Slamboree pay-per-view event, subtitled A Legends Reunion, at the Omni in Atlanta, Georgia. This inaugural event was marked by Davy Boy Smith's victory over Big Man Vader, the then champion, via disqualification in a match for the WCW World Heavyweight Championship. Slamboree 93 celebrated wrestling's past and present with the induction of legends such as Luthez, Mr. Wrestling 2, Vern Garnier and Eddie Graham into the WCW Hall of Fame. WWE decided to make the annual King of the Ring tournament into a televised event. It took place on June the 13th, 1993 at the Nutter Center in Dayton, Ohio. The first time King of the Ring would get its own pay-per-view and have the tournament finale as the main event of the show. In the weeks leading up to the event, combatants had to fight in a series of qualification matches on regular weekly WWF programming, with only rounds 2, 3 and 4 being shown at the special event. Bret Hart won the tournament by defeating Razor Ramon, Mr. Perfect, in what is a match that is absolutely worth going back and watching, it's on another level, and Bam Bam Bigelow. Truly what felt like an apology from Vince for the horror of WrestleMania 9, Bret was allowed to wrestle in three completely different styles, with contrasting opponents' threats, all while gathering injuries and fatigue. For the length of the event, Bret wrestled almost 50 minutes across the three displays, he shined in every way and started to gather pace towards the eventual stardom that he became synonymous with. King of the Ring was one of my greatest nights. I prided myself on working different styles with different guys and I appreciated that every single one of my matches that night was different. There's always a lot of pressure on you on a big pay-per-view, especially a pay-per-view like that, since it was the first one, but I was up for the challenge. The Super Summer Sizzler Spectacular, produced by NWA Eastern Championship Wrestling, took place on June the 19th, 1993, in the ECW Arena in Philadelphia. 
This event was significant as it was ECW's first supercard and the first ECW event ever released on VHS. The main event featured a Texas chain match massacre between hot star Veddy Gilbert, accompanied by Paul E. Dangerously, and Terry Funk, with the title of King of Philadelphia at stake. In this unique match, the competitors were chained together at the wrists, and the winner had to be the first to touch all four turnbuckles consecutively. The match ended controversially when Funk, after touching all four turnbuckles, was not declared the winner. Gilbert then attacked Funk with a chair and delivered a pile driver onto said chair, enabling him to touch all four corners and claim the victory. Post-match, it was revealed that the referee, Kevin Christian, was actually Freddie Gilbert, Eddie Gilbert's brother, who had cheated on Eddie's behalf. The event culminated in a brawl between Funk and ECW Commissioner Todd Gordon against Gilbert and Dangerously, after which Funk gave Gordon the King of Philadelphia crown and praised the company. On July the 7th, WCW Worldwide commenced its taping at Disney MGM Studios in Orlando, Florida. These sessions produced matches and footage scheduled to air starting the weekend of August the 28th. We all subconsciously assess one another when we first meet a stranger for the first time. It's human nature, hardwired into our DNA. We may not even realise we're doing it, but we are. How many of you can say that you've never been introduced to a completely new person, perhaps through a friend or someone at work? This person makes you laugh immediately with their introduction, stands confidently and takes time to listen to you and make note of your name. They're wearing clothes which you seem to like and as they engage with you in whatever small talk is necessary to break the ice, you both feel more at ease in each other's presence and the conversation begins to flow. But admit it, We've all been unfortunate enough to suffer through the opposite. A cold hello, followed by a succession of long pauses and brutally repetitive interruptions, perhaps a mutually sweaty handshake and then a swift exit. For some unknown reason, in this moment, you've just got an instant dislike, distrust or outright disdain for this poor unsuspecting stranger. And they probably don't want to come rushing back for excruciating conversation round two anytime soon. They may be well-intentioned, kind and potentially a new friend, but perhaps they have the same strong aftershave as someone you dislike from years past. Perhaps they have the exact same watch as that teacher you always hated at school, or the same hair as someone who bullied you in your distant memories. None of these characteristics are logical reasons to dislike someone. Most times, it's easy enough to overcome these small obstacles in our subconscious behaviour and move on to healthy and fruitful relationships with people who we may not have initially been so attracted to. But sometimes, they're not. Sometimes, someone can make such a terrible first impression so as that the first memory is seared into your mind's eye. Every time you think of them, that's the moment that you first recall. And that isn't a particularly pleasant thought. I'd like to think that we're better than that, but... Admit it, there is at least one person who tripped over and spilled their lunch in the cafeteria at school, or who puked on their first big night out when they turned 18. If you take it up by about a hundred orders of magnitude, imagine making a first impression in pro wrestling, live, unedited and viral to millions around the world. Yes, part of the draw for fans like me, who watch wrestling regularly, is the sense of the unexpected. Usually that means moments like these that live long in the memory as truly unpredictable and astonishing. But sometimes it means moments like these, which WWE and other pro wrestling companies are much more fond of the idea of us forgetting ever happened. Oh, and if you were one of those people who said that you couldn't think of anyone who made a bad first impression which you couldn't erase from your mind, no, you still haven't thought of anyone, well... You are too high-minded and gracious to ever hold on to such a terrible first memory of someone, I get it. Let me remind you then of Fred Alex Ottman, forever known in the annals of sports entertainment folklore as the Shockmaster. From 1989 to 1993, Fred Ottman had been used in small parts as one half of large bulky tag teams such as the natural disasters in the WWF. Ottman had struggled to find his niche in his early career, going under different monikers such as Big Steel Man 
and the much less menacing sounding Tugboat Tyler, which eventually got shortened to the now iconic Tugboat. One of the worst names ever bestowed upon a character in perhaps all of wrestling's history. By 1993, Tugboat's partners had gone their separate ways and after having a few singles matches, left the WWF, heading to their rival company WCW, where he would be honoured to be blessed with the most perfect character, outfitted in state-of-the-art sci-fi clothing and even having his voice edited to have more charisma and be more intimidating. Debuting alongside the likes of Sting and Ric Flair, he shot straight into the main event picture and in one of the biggest wrestling companies in the world. Fred Ottman went on to have, undoubtedly, the greatest wrestling career of any performer to ever grace the screens of WCW. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. This happened. Fred Ottman was given a Star Wars Stormtrooper helmet painted with silver paint and glitter, a vest, and told to burst through this wall. The Shockmaster lived up to his name as Ottman tripped on a low wooden beam, to gasps and laughs from the crowd in attendance. But that was only the start of revealing Ottman's identity live to the world. Surely that was enough to have finished this character off. But no. As Ottman clambered to put his helmet back on and regained his feet, the live wrestling segment had to continue. The other wrestlers were stifling laughter as they had to try and get through their scripts. The idea for the Shockmaster's voice was for a mic to be rigged up and off screen, a performer with a better grasp of how to cut a menacing promo would be relayed over the top of the audio, with Ottman simply moving his arms and head in order to seem like the words were coming from him. Simple in theory, but the delay caused by the setup of the audio equipment meant that the whole show just fell apart, alongside, unfortunately, Fred Ottman's career. The 1993 Japan Grand Prix, hosted by All Japan Women's Pro Wrestling on August the 21st, was a prominent round-robin tournament featuring two blocks of eight women each. The competition ran from May the 3rd to August the 21st. The top two finishers from each block advanced to a single elimination tournament, culminating in Akira Hokuto being crowned the champion. This event highlighted the skill and athleticism of all the participants, further establishing the prestige of women's professional wrestling in Japan. During SummerSlam 1993 in Auburn Hills, Michigan, Lex Luger's match against the WWF champion Yokozuna, accompanied by Jim Cornette and Mr. Fuji, ended controversially. Luger won by countout after using his metal-plated forearm to knock Yokozuna out, but as per wrestling rules, titles don't often change hands during a countout. Typically, such a victory would leave a babyface wrestler with mixed feelings, but the aftermath of this match was unusual. Luger's win was celebrated extravagantly, with other babyface wrestlers lifting him in the air amid a shower of red, white and blue balloons, creating a scene akin to a championship victory, despite Luger not actually really winning anything. In September of 1993, World Championship Wrestling formally split from the National Wrestling Alliance due to a dispute over who had the authority to authorise NWA World Heavyweight Championship title changes. This disagreement ultimately led WCW to become a distinct and standalone wrestling promotion, separate from any other organisation, including the NWA. This move marked a significant shift in the professional wrestling landscape as WCW established itself as an independent entity in the wrestling world. Following his departure from WCW, Heyman endeavoured to establish a new wrestling promotion in Texas alongside Jim Crockett Jr. However, disagreements emerged as Crockett aimed to construct a traditional wrestling brand, while Heyman firmly believed that traditional wrestling was outdated and in need of a fresh approach. I always felt tasked to do something new and different and never done before, first time ever, a different approach, a new twist on things, so that was the only conflict that we really had. Eddie wanted to rehash but update and I wanted to start from a blank piece of paper and make things up from the get go. Heyman was later brought into ECW by Gordon and Gilbert in order to help train up new wrestlers in the arts of microphone magic and also as a commentator for their weekly television shows going forward. Heyman also managed Jimmy Snooker and a host of other ECW talents on screen. And as we'd seen, from his meteoric rise from such a young age, Heyman was driven by success and power. 
The second he walked through the doors at ECW, he set to work making himself the most important man in the company. In Paul Heyman, ECW had now gained a wrestling mind, but it still needed to find its voice. Joey Styles began his career in professional wrestling as an announcer while he was still a student at Hofstra University. He got his start with Tony Capone's North American Wrestling Alliance during this time. He would often share announcing duties with former WWE announcer Craig DeGeorge or collaborate with him as a two-man commentary team. Additionally, Styles hosted a segment called NAWA Superstar Stats where he provided insights into the wrestlers and their achievements. I had decided that I wanted to be a professional wrestling television announcer for my career despite what my my parents thought and my teachers thought and what pretty much all but one of my friends thought that was my my silly dream the NAWA was briefly televised on Sports Channel America which is now NBC Sports Network in 1992 Styles crossed paths with a man named Paul E which would prove to be the most significant encounter of his wrestling career. Welcome back to Eastern Championship Wrestling. I am Joey Styles in the ECW Control Center. Paul told me to come to ECW for a tryout, but Paul wasn't the executive producer or booker. He was just a talent. His friend Eddie Gilbert was the booker and Todd Gordon was the owner. Unfortunately, Paul didn't tell anyone that he offered me the tryout because he had no business doing it and I showed up in Philly. I found the building, started getting dressed backstage, and I was in my tighty whities when Todd Gordon walked up to me. Todd asked, who are you? And I told him I was there for the announcing audition, and he said, I own ECW and don't know a thing about it. What the hell are you doing in my building? And that was the start of my career with ECW. At first, Styles worked backstage organising and promoting events, but it was his passion in front of the audience which he wanted to provide his skills at. When Paul was in the office, I showed him a tape of the only independent show I had announced. It was at Mount Vernon High School in New York, and it was in June of 1992, and between my junior and senior years of college. It was called the North American Wrestling Alliance, and Hercules and Tony Atlas were the veterans on the card. Taz was doing a Tasmaniac character with no shoes, long hair, and his face painted. The pretty boy Tommy Dreamer was wearing these ridiculous sequin suspenders, baggy pants and a robe that his mum had made. Sean Waltman was there as the lightning kid, so there was a lot of talent there. I was a hill colour commentator and I made history by becoming the worst colour commentator ever. Although he was fresh faced and with little in the way of experience, Joey Styles showed that he had a passion for pro wrestling and a willingness to improve and grow under Heyman's tutelage. Paul saw a young, smart-mouthed New Yorker, and he thought, I'm going to create my own announcer in the mould of Gordon Soley, who can be the straight man in the middle of all of this chaos. Paul made me his choice, and he trained me. He had been trained to announce in WCW by Jim Ross. When Paul trained me, he told me specifically, everything I'm telling you was told to me, word for word, by Jim Ross. So I'm training you the way that Jim Ross trained me. Joey, um was a different kind of announcer. Nobody had really ever done what he did. I mean, he, the only person that I know that could single-handedly do an entire pay-per-view without a, a color commentator. On June the 19th, 1993, Joey Styles made his first appearance at the electrifying Super Summer Sizzler Spectacular event held in Philadelphia. Styles took on the role of the exclusive host for the ECW Hardcore TV, serving as the sole announcer during the initial phase of the show. He skillfully provided play-by-play -play commentary and insightful colour analysis for both television and pay-per-view broadcasts going forward, infusing the programmes with his extensive wrestling expertise, infectious enthusiasm and impeccable comedic timing. On September the 19th, WCW hosted its first full brawl pay-per-view event in Houston, Texas at the Astro Arena. The main event was a War Games match where the teams of Sting, Davey Boy Smith, Dustin Rhodes and the Shockmaster, accompanied by Road Warrior Animal, triumphed over Sid Vicious, Vader and Harlem Heat of Cole and Kane, who were joined by Harley Race and Colonel Robert Parker. Full Brawl 93 also featured significant title changes, including Rick Rude defeating Ric Flair for the WCW International World Heavyweight Championship, Lord Regal winning the World Television Championship, and the Nasty Boys claiming the World Tag Team titles. The hottest team to hit the waves. Self-mode engaged. Is back in action.
So you've watched the entirety of the 1993 flop TV series Thunder in Paradise and you enjoyed it so much that even after you'd consumed all 22 episodes, you still wanted more. Well, have I got a treat for you. How about a spin-off film? With Hulk Hogan reprising his role as Randolph J. Hurricane Spencer, an ex-Navy SEAL in a film so bland that even though I literally just watched it and made notes, I've forgotten the entire thing. I've heard that this is what can happen with intense head trauma, perhaps my brain just shut itself off in order to protect it from the bombardment of illogical writing, cringeworthy acting and badly filmed action. The opening title sequence sets the tone for the entire piece. A poorly set of visuals depicting women in bikinis made me think of a bad rip-off of a James Bond sequence. The music is taken straight from an 80s porno and it all feels somewhat like a Tim and Eric sketch for some bizarre reason. Is this aimed at children? The whole thing feels dirty and a little creepy if so. Why do we need to see so many boobs and bums if this film was made for kids? Thunder in Paradise 2 is jam-packed with pro wrestling stars including Brutus Beefcake and Jim the Anvil Neidhart and I found myself looking past the action in the foreground and spending the majority of the runtime of the film scanning the extras and supporting cast to see if I recognised any others in the film. And that says a lot. I'm the kind of person who likes to sit quietly on my own and really absorb a movie, paying attention to every frame and hanging off every line of dialogue. But with Thunder in Paradise 2, that becomes almost impossible. When it finished, I felt a sense of relief. I thought to myself, thank goodness, I made it through this monstrosity. I was glad that I'd never have to spend any more of my time on the Gulf Coast with Hogan and his Navy SEAL buddies. He's got no guts. He's got the girls. And he's about to lose what he loves the most. Mean Gene Oakland, a highly regarded figure in the professional wrestling world, made his debut with World Championship Wrestling on October the 6th, during a taping of WCW Saturday Night in Atlanta, Georgia. This episode later aired on November the 5th. Oakland's move to WCW at this time was a significant shift in his career, as he had previously been synonymous with the WWF. His debut in WCW marked the beginning of a new chapter for both Oakland and the promotion, bringing his unique interviewing style and comedic presence to WCW broadcasts. In pro wrestling, there are many moves which are designed to make it appear as if the performers have legitimately caused serious injury to one another. This can lead to more fan support for the supposed injured wrestler as they fight through the pain on their way to capture victory. However, after only three years as a professional wrestler, Jesus Javier Hernandez Silva was still learning the ropes when he began to attempt these kind of stunts in his matches. Known by his in-ring name of Oro, Silva was the son of a luchador who seemingly had wrestling in his DNA. In 1993, Oro performed a move in which he was supposed to appear to the crowd as if he had injured his neck, but cruel irony struck as during the performance, he landed awkwardly and in fact severely injured himself, collapsing in the ring. It was clear something was wrong as wrestlers and medical staff attempted to help Oro towards an ambulance, the young wrestler dying of what is believed to be an aneurysm before he could receive any medical aid. The 1993 Halloween Havoc, held on October the 24th at the Lakefront Arena in New Orleans, Louisiana, was the fifth annual event of its kind produced by WCW. A notable highlight of this pay-per-view event was the Texas Deathmatch featuring Big Fan Vader, accompanied again by Harley Race against Cactus Jack. This match, known for its intensity and physicality in the years since, added to the overall allure and excitement of the Halloween-themed wrestling event, marking it as a memorable addition in the series. One violent incident between Sid Vicious and Arn Anderson occurred on October the 27th in Blackburn, England. The aggression was a result of a heated argument that escalated dramatically. After spending hours on the road with little sleep and too much alcohol consumed, tempers flared between the two wrestlers, reportedly over a remark made about Ric Flair, a friend of Anderson. 
The dispute escalated to a violent confrontation in the hotel hallway involving a pair of scissors. This brutal altercation resulted in Arn Anderson suffering 20 stab wounds to the chest and stomach, while Sid Vicious was stabbed more than four times. Following the incident, both wrestlers spent the night in the hospital and were subsequently deported back to America. Sid faced the repercussions of this altercation within WCW as he was fired after several wrestlers threatened to walk out if he was not terminated, whilst Anderson received only a suspension. In the aftermath, Sid Vicious apologised to Anderson for the incident and they are reported to be on good terms today. In 1993, WCW Battle Bowl was held on November the 20th in Pensacola, Florida. It was a unique event, primarily featuring the Battle Bowl tournament. This tournament was structured around the lethal lottery concept, where tag teams were formed by randomly drawing names. The team that won their respective matches then progressed to the Battle Bowl Battle Royal main event. This concept had been previously used in Starcade 1991 and 92, but 93 marked its debut as a standalone show. Big Van Vader, who was the WCW World Heavyweight Champion at the time, emerged victorious in this battle royal, lastly eliminating Sting. The final stages of the match saw dramatic moments with Vader's manager Harley Race pulling Ric Flair out of the ring, leading to Flair's elimination. The final showdown between Sting and Vader ended with Vader achieving victory. The 1993 Battle Bowl was a significant event in the company's history, showcasing the promotion's ability to create unique and engaging wrestling formats. Vader's triumph at this event further cemented his status as a dominant force within the company. The event also marked a period of expansion for WCW in terms of its pay-per-view offerings as it added more shows to its annual schedule. What are the chances that they set up this thing and the only place that the possibility to end the match is me having him and his maneuver? The following November at Survivor Series 93, one of the key stories leading into the event was the ongoing feud between Brett and Jerry the King Lawler. But with Lawler unable to compete due to an ongoing legal dispute, the details of which I won't discuss in this video, Brett was left without a match. The advertised bout was set to take place in the classic Survivor Series format of two themed teams, one headed by Brett featuring his brothers Owen, Bruce and Keith, the other with Jerry the King Lawler leading out a team of masked knights. However, with Lawler out, Sean replaced him, but due to the last minute switch, WWF didn't have time to organise and advertise Michaels to have another team with him. So that night in Boston, we were treated to a lacklustre bout between the Hart brothers and Sean Michaels and his knights, whose identities were hidden behind lucha masks as I think even Vince McMahon knew these characters were going to be a one off. If you're interested, Greg Valentine was the Blue Knight and Barry Horowitz was the Red Knight, and Jeff Gaylord was the Black Knight. Shawn Michaels ended up walking out of the match for a count out, handing the victory to the opposing team. The match was less about the story between Brett and Shawn, the drama of the story came when Owen Hart was eliminated at the fault of team leader Brett, which created tension after the final bell and led into their now iconic feud moving forward. A month later in December of 1993, the next match between the pair took the stakes to the next level. The animosity between the two men had grown to a point where a regular singles match couldn't confine the aggression. Outside interference had caused a number of non-finishes to several matches along the feud thus far, and so the WWF sanctioned a match in Germany between Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart inside of a steel cage. In a short match which didn't have any room to gain momentum, Hart was victorious over Michaels in a timely 11 minutes, the hitman making the escape over the top of the cage when Michaels got his boot and tights trapped in the cage's construction, leaving him hanging upside down with little recourse. The match itself which took place as part of a WWF European tour was held back from television and only saw the light of day when a Coliseum home video featured this hidden gem as part of a Best of Germany feature VHS. This would prove to be a point at which all parties felt it valuable to take a break from the rivalry, as Michaels and Hart went their separate ways over the next 18 months. The Larry Cameron, there he is. Making his way to the ring. 
After making the transition from the Canadian Football League to pro wrestling in the late 80s and early 90s, lethal Larry Cameron began to pick up speed as he earned notoriety as a supreme athlete inside of the ring, both in North America and Europe. Chris, I worked with lethal Larry Cameron on a tour of Australia about a year and a half ago. He's recognized as the world champion by the International Wrestling Association. He is one of the most awesome professional wrestlers in the world. By 1993, Larry had made several appearances with World Championship Wrestling before focusing his wrestling attention to Germany, where he had his most successful run. Problem, woman? You want to get carried up also? During a match against Tony St. Clair in Bremen, Larry Cameron was struck with a large heart attack, which killed him almost instantly. The referees and medical staff on call tried their best as they rushed to Larry's aid, but nothing could be done to save him from a fate seen far too often for wrestlers in the 90s. Larry Cameron was declared dead at the age of 41. On December the 27th, Starcade, WCW's 11th annual pay-per-view event, celebrated its 10th anniversary at the Independence Arena in Charlotte, North Carolina. The event was notable for Ric Flair's return to Starcade, his first since 1990. The main event featured Ric Flair defeating Vader, the reigning WCW World Heavyweight Champion, in a title versus career match. The event also included notable matches like the Nasty Boys vs Sting and Road Warrior Hawk for the WCW Tag Team Championship, Rick Rude vs The Boss for the WCW International World Heavyweight Championship, and a two out of three falls match between Dustin Rhodes and Steve Austin for the United States belt. Wrestling Observer's Newsletter's Wrestler of the Year for 1993 was Big Van Vader. Pro Wrestling Illustrated also gave their highest honour for 1993 Wrestler of the Year to WCW's standout big man. Vader had been in and around the WCW World Championship picture all year with standout matches against Ric Flair and Sting. Yokozuna ended 1993 as WWF Champion, having held on to the title since King of the Ring on June the 13th. Razor Ramon was in possession of the Intercontinental Belt, with his reign extending into 1994 from his victory in September. The WWF Women's World Championship was still held by Alundra Blaze since her victory at the tournament in December, and the company's tag belts ended up around the wastes of the Quebecers at the end of the year. WCW had recently crowned Ric Flair as their top star at Starcade on December the 27th. Their USA Championship also changed hands at the same event, with Steve Austin claimed as the champion at the end of 1993. The WCW Tag Championships were held at the end of the year by the Nasty Boys. Terry Funk had reclaimed the ECW World Heavyweight belt just five days prior as he ended 1993 as the company's top champion and a figurehead for the brand going forward. It was a year where we saw the gradual phasing out of the old wrestling style and the gradual phasing in of a more athletic style of technical wrestling becoming more pronounced across the industry as a whole. Legends like Ric Flair returned to WCW after his stint in WWF, bringing with him a wealth of experience and star power back to the promotion. Overall, 1993 was a pivotal year in the wrestling world, representing a period of change and a hint of the dynamic, personality-driven narratives that would come to dominate the industry in the years to follow. It was a time of experimentation and laying down the foundations that would hold strong for decades to come. 